Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, the show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. The only real estate brokerage that donates 50% of its net commissions to 501c3 nonprofit organizations dedicated to fighting climate change. Bruce, this is a it's a real true honor. I'm I'm ecstatic to have you here. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your amazing schedule to join me today. Well, I'm honored to be a part of your program and, and share with those that listen to you about what we do. So thanks for the invitation. Um, it's my absolute pleasure. And for those of you who don't know who this is, we're of course going to get into it. But Bruce is was a guest on Simon Sinek's podcast and ha- just happens to be the, my favorite single podcast I've ever listened to in my entire life. So I'm excited to share everything he's doing with y'all. Um, so we always like to get this podcast started with a little bit of background on Bruce, who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the current moment. Yeah, so um, I've been in Atlanta 30 years now. I grew up in the mountains of Virginia and I went to college after that. I went into traditional ministry for about 14 years. So I served on staff at some churches in Florida, Georgia, and Virginia. Um, married during that time. So married to my wife, Rhonda, for 35 years now. We have five daughters. Uh, four of them are married, have eight grandchildren. Seven of those are boys. So all of my girls are giving me boys now. And, uh, and so I started an organization called City Refuge 25 years ago here in the inner city of Atlanta. And uh, so that's a little background of how I got to where I am and sort of what my life looks like today. Yeah, very awesome. Quick and to the point. I appreciate it. What do you think are like some of the most formative experiences from your youth that have led you to be where you are right now? Yeah, so my dad was a pastor. And so uh, he was uh, the mentality that everybody deserves a chance. Uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about giving people second chances. But my dad sort of instilled to me that a lot of folks who find themselves in crisis actually never had a first chance. So they were born into poverty or into an abusive environment and and they just never had the first chance. So he was all about giving people a chance. So that was instilled in me. Uh, we pastored small rural churches and a lot of poverty, a lot of people in need. And we just had people live with us my whole childhood growing up. There would be somebody new on a regular basis. Uh, my dad also led um, benevolent kid kind of work all over the world. So uh, he went to multiple countries around the world to build churches and houses and dig wells and and do those kind of things. Worked a long time uh, with the Navajo reservation in New Mexico where he was, he and my mom were heavily involved. So basically my whole childhood, it was just modeled in front of me that, you know, life is more about what you can do for others versus what you can do for yourself or expect others to do for you. And so, you know, there was a time where I wondered if that was really the right way and, you know, chose some um, some adventures that my dad might not have been proud of, but uh, eventually found my way back to sort of that path he had established for us and, and just built on what I had been taught all the way through my childhood and young adult years. So not only were you given an amazing first chance, I take it your father and your family were close and they took care of you, but you were constantly watching your dad bring in other people and take care of them on top of taking care of you. And how many siblings did you have? Yeah. So I have two brothers and a sister. So there were, there were six of us in the family and yeah, that's a great way to put it. You know, he was caring for all of us and, and then at the same time as a family, we were caring for others. You know, I didn't even realize that me giving up my bed when I was seven years old for a mom with her daughter that the husband was abusive was caring for them. I look back now and I realized that, you know, I was actually uh, living out what I do now as a child and just didn't realize it. I just knew that we were having fun building a tent in the closet to sleep in uh, and didn't realize I was actually serving somebody that was in a place of need. Do you know anyone else that's had a a life experience like your own? Is there anyone that you find similar to yourself in this respect? Well, you know, I mean, I know a lot of people who've been very sacrificial in their life um, and and the things they chose to do. Um, I don't necessarily know those that that grew up in the environment I did with such a, a, a stable, solid kind of upbringing and then chose to go and hang out in a place that was absolutely polar opposite of that to try and give those people the same opportunity I had. You know, it's a a phrase I use periodically is I was born with momentum, right? Two parent household, 
great educational opportunities, church if I wanted it, all these things. And and so many people in our community and the other communities now around the country were served. They were born actually with reverse momentum, right? So uh, the, the opportunity for them to find a better way was nearly zero unless somebody else chose to come alongside them. And so it's a, it's an interesting place to be in life um, in the fact that there are a lot of people who really like what we do and support what we do, but not a ton of people want to sign up. Right. Yeah. Um, everyone's caught up in their, their own experience. I, t- I think it takes a, a lot of introspection and trying to find something beyond yourself to kind of get on a mission and then enter this path of just continual service. But I think it's the most meaningful way to spend your life. And before we get into talking about exactly what you do on a day to day, I did want to ask how your personal faith has guided your decisions and helped you go down the path that you're on now over the years. Sure. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a good question. And I, I rarely lead with my faith because in this world in which we live, you know, there are all kinds of faiths or all kinds of people who don't have faith at all. So I certainly don't Uh, get on a soapbox about that. But personally, you know, my relationship with God and when I read scripture, which is sort of the map for me in life, it just, uh, you know, for example, in the Bible, there are over 400 references to care for the poor, the needy, the homeless, the broken, the children, the the orphans, right? So if that's that's where I'm going to live my life is in a place of faith, then I should live out what the tenets of that faith look like. Right. And so for me, it's whatever you choose to follow. If you're really going to be a true disciple of that, then you should live out all the tenets of whatever that happens to me. For me, that happens to be Christianity. And that's the way I live out my life. So if I'm truly going to live what I profess, then I need to be looking into that textbook on a regular basis and finding out what the expression of that profession should be. All right. And let's talk about how you've done that. Uh, Can you tell me the beginning of City of Refuge and what it has become over 25 years? Yeah. So 25 years ago, I was invited downtown, um, literally on a six month consulting assignment to close a little church to sell the property a couple of miles from our current location. Five or six Sundays in, a young lady in crisis walked in and, and her words were, I've been hooking and stripping 14 years. Can you help me get out of the life? We did some things for her. She brought somebody else in crisis. They brought somebody else in crisis. Four months into a six month assignment, we walk in. There are literally a hundred folks in crisis. So addiction, alcoholism, homelessness, returning citizens from incarceration, all had invited each other to this little church and, and are looking at us going, can you help us? And, you know, sort of in a, in a cynical kind of snide remark, I looked at my wife and said, we've been conned by God, woman, right? Because this was not the path we intended. You know, we, again, from the mountains of Virginia, I intended to go back there. You know, I intended to be um, hunting and fishing and, you know, doing the things you do in the mountains, not hanging out in the hood in the inner city. Uh, but we just decided to take on that challenge. So we resigned our position. We had four daughters at the time. They were seven, five, three, and one. And, and we started pastoring that little church, but immediately started City of Refuge because I knew what we were going to do didn't really fit in any kind of church environment necessarily. And out of that, we started after school program for 20 kids, which evolved into caring for the moms, which evolved into caring for the homeless guys on the way to pick up the moms and children. We started foster care and guardianship for little girls whose moms would go to rehab or to jail to solve their legal issues. When mom would get out of jail, she didn't have anywhere to go. She would move in. So we started a housing program actually inside that church. And so we lived there six years and, uh, you know, some of the interesting side notes is in those six years we're broken into nearly three dozen times and vehicles stolen. And I've been in super, uh, superior court with guys who wanted to take my life. And uh, so, you know, it. Uh, while some people think it's really cool to do this sort of different outside the box kind of work, there were some other elements that came along with that, um, that that made life a bit challenging. So that was sort of how we got started and, and led to the opportunity to do some of the bigger things we're doing now. And and what exactly are you doing now? How has it evolved from just foster? It sounds like just foster care to something much bigger. Yeah. So so 18 years ago, we were donated eight acres of land with a 210,000 square foot warehouse building on it. So my dream was let's create a one stop shop for those in crisis. So if you're in crisis, let's take, for example, a single mom with a couple of kids and now finds herself homeless 
The path is she has to make an appointment here for housing, here for medical care, here for addiction recovery, here for mental health. She's got to go somewhere else to get vocational training. She's got to find child care. She's got to find $95 to ride public transportation in Atlanta. So that journey from brokenness to wholeness is so arduous and difficult that she most of the time just quit somewhere along the journey. So my philosophy was, what if we did everything that somebody needs on one campus? And so today, uh, for example, we have 120 beds for homeless mothers and children who live here for 180 days at a time with all the wraparound services, medical, mental health, dental, vision, parenting classes, financial literacy, vocational training, a free daycare, a private school on campus, uh, all the things that she needs. Uh, we said, so that's part of that. So the kids, so we have the daycare, we have the school, we have an after school program, summer camp program. We said, well, what, you know, if this mom comes to us with some uh, vocational challenges, what do we do about that? So we started a workforce innovation hub. And so we trained people in auto technician and culinary arts and coding academy and cybersecurity and customer service and hospitality put about 500 individuals a year into the workforce, uh, individuals who have obstacles to employment. You know, our neighborhood has the highest incarceration, incarceration rate in the state of Georgia. So if you have the highest incarceration rate, you're gonna have the highest number of returning citizens. So we started a returning citizens program and we actually go into prison and serve those men and women during their last year of incarceration, equip them with the job skills, tools that they need in order to be successful when they come out. And, and so there's reentry skills, re reunification with your family skills, finance skills, and they start their vocational training during those last three months that they're incarcerated. So the two weeks after they're released, they have their OSHA certification or a CDL or forklift certification, go straight into the workforce. Had a dramatic encounter eight years ago with a young lady who had been sex trafficked across the country. And, uh, just really heartbreaking story. And I just told my wife, we're going, we're, we're starting a program. And so, Eight years later, we've now served more than 800 women who've been sexually trafficked and exploited. And so we're a, a drop-off location for the Atlanta Police Department, GBI, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security. Um, so that, those things are taking place. We're in construction now on a, a home that will open later this spring, a 13-bedroom home for juvenile survivors, 11 to 17-year-old female survivors of trafficking. And out of that, we launched around the country. So we now have nine locations. We have four in Georgia, three in Virginia. We're in Chicago and Baltimore. And we have in the pipeline right now, Dallas, Nashville, St. Charles, Missouri, New Orleans, Cincinnati, and Chicago. And um, so my, my six-month assignment is now 25 years. Yeah. And uh, still got 25 to go. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm so excited to see how it continues to spread. Thank you so much for sharing the, the bit about the future as well. And this all just started out as you and your wife starting this. Yeah. yeah it just started just the two of us and about two dozen folks in this little rundown church. And, uh, and most of them left when they realized the kind of work we were going to do. So I think we kept three of the 25 and, and started building. So what's really interesting to me about this is that you sound exactly like a CEO of a large corporation, but it seems to me that the product that you're selling or giving away or whatever you want to call it, it really is selling because you get a return, is love. Love for people who really desperately need it and the services and the skills that they haven't been given by the basic of society, their parents. They didn't learn to walk. You literally have to re reteach them. And it just seems like the most meaningful way to spend your time. How has it been like logistically building this? And it's all a nonprofit, right? How has it been logistically right. building out the system working in the nonprofit space? Well, you make a great observation. You know, our, our mission statement is we bring light, hope and transformation, right? So, so many people have been living in darkness. We just want to turn the light on and show them there's a different way. Often when you turn the light on, they believe that there is a different way, but they don't believe it's for them. So that's where we have to birth hope that not only is this for somebody else, it's for you. If we can get them to buy the light hope, the transformation takes place, which is based on love, right? It's just your, to your point, it's because we love humanity and, and we love those um, that find themselves in difficult places. And so, you know, the journey has been, and to your point about potentially sound like CEO, this, this has to be done with excellence, right? Uh, far too many uh, organizations that serve as poverty alleviation organizations, unfortunately, have a poverty mentality themselves. 
so they don't do things at the highest level. We want to do things at the most excellent level that it can be done. So if you came to our campus, it's spectacular. I mean, it's in the inner city, but it looks like, I mean, it's our housings are like, you know, four-star hotels. It's not dormitory style. It's not bunk beds. It's beautiful individual spaces. It's spectacular food service. It's the vocational training hub is, you know, it looks like, a, you know, a modern Apple or Google workforce innovation space. You know, it's just what we do. And so we've had to help donors and investors and partners along the way understand we're not here to just be a triage handout organization. We're here to provide a pathway of opportunity so that people can find themselves independent and self-sustainable in a shorter period of time than they could anywhere else. And to do that, you have to use the best business principles possible. You have to study organizations around the country and find best practices and implement those practices. And then you have to fill the gaps. Whatever you can't find, you have to figure out how to build your own systems and processes inside of that. So my team's a great team, very passionate, about 100 employees in, in our nonprofit. And, and from Simon, by the way, um, that you talk about, we, we started calling ourselves a four impact organization, mm -hmm. right? Just makes a big difference. We're here for impact. And so uh, to do that, I have to have a, a substantial team, but we hire out of culture, not craft. So we want to make sure that people have the right heart, right motivation. I can train them and teach them but I can't necessarily make them think right. And so I want them to have the right heart and motivation when they come in. So building out HR, building out benefits for our staff, building out systems and processes and dashboards for us to be able to measure what we do. All of that's a key part of what we do. And all of that is based on the fact that we have the opportunity to spend hours and hours every day with people in crisis. Yeah. When you wake up every day in the morning, do you feel like you are living the exact life you were meant to live and you're always happy and full of energy? I'm just curious. Without question. I mean, this is my destiny, my purpose. You know, my wife laughs and uh, she says, you don't need an alarm clock. Your passion wakes you up every morning. You know, I just love what I do. I, I love the. I love that this is my destiny, my calling. I love that it's my vocation. I don't consider it a vocation, honestly. Uh, but but it is it is where my gifts and talents I think are, can be best used to make the world a better place. And you felt like that for at least eighteen plus years. Yeah, I felt like it the whole twenty five years. I mean, that first year you're looking around going, okay, I'm trying not to get shot. But you know, at the end of the day, I just it. it I, I've never doubted since Ron and I made the decision to come downtown Atlanta. I've never doubted that this is what I'm supposed to do. There, I mean. You know, you mentioned I'm not necessarily happy every day, um, you know, happy is that external feeling, but I but I do have joy every day. Correct. Because I know what's going on is is the right thing. You know, we've lost really good friends from the city to death, to overdose, to suicide, to, you know, uh, we've had people that we've trusted steal things from us and leave. You know, we've so there are days that happiness is not my companion, uh, but but contentment and satisfaction that this is the right thing are always my companion. Yes. So when someone does something like that, do they ever return and apologize? And if they do, how do you respond to that? Yeah. You know, um, Atlanta, most cities are like this, but Atlanta has um, an interstate that circles the entire city, um, interstate 285. So literally goes all the way around the city. And when people leave, whether we have to ask them to leave because of behavior or they leave, because of rebellion, my, my comment is often they're just they're just on 285. They're going in a circle. They'll take some wrong exits along the way, but eventually they'll take an exit back to city refuge. And when they do, we'll be here and uh, and we'll receive them back. And so unless there is a, a violence issue or a threat to human life issue, um, that's about the only reasons we don't take somebody back. Right. Very interesting. Um, oh, yeah, I do want to. I'm like wondering to ask you if, like, when you were a teenager, if you ever had like hatred for someone, and then once you became an adult, like those feelings just all disappeared, and you just say, Everyone's trying their best. We're all humans. We all make mistakes. Just this endless uh, idea of forgiveness, understanding someone's perspective, and then just trying to be a light in their life, I think is like, it's just, it's such a, most people don't think about, about things in that way. Like if someone wrongs you that people want revenge, but I think if you really can think about it deeply, 
what you really want is to be happy and enjoy your life and having these these strong feelings of anger or revenge it doesn't actually give you satisfaction like you mentioned the word joy versus like pleasure like if you maybe you know like when the criminal gets tried everyone's all riled up and wants them to have their punishment but that's just that and then the, when the person gets punished it's just a bit of like joy it's like yay they got what they deserve but i so not joy up uh, on um, pleasure but when you are living your life in, in in service to others you continually feeling this joy that you are doing the best you can possibly be you're creating more happiness and more joy in the world i don't know it's cool yeah yeah and you know there there is this line that we draw periodically now there's some people who just want to live criminal lifestyles or they want to live rebellious lifestyles or they want to take advantage of others. And so, you know, in the streets of Atlanta, you know, I'm, I'm well known for our compassion and welcoming, but I'm also well known for the fact that I will draw a line and, and you will be sort of told to know in certain terms that we're not the place for you right now because your attitude is not an attitude of receiving in order to change. So if you're here just to take advantage of and, and to see what you can get out of the process without being contributor to the process, that doesn't work for us. And so uh, it's, it's you know, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Trust First, and that's our attitude. We're going to trust you until you prove we can't. Most places you have to prove you should be trusted. For us, we'll trust you day one. And when you prove you can't be trusted, now we have to start over. And what that does is it, it, activate something in people's lives when you trust them before they have to prove it. And all of a sudden they go, well, if you believe in me, I can believe in myself. And periodically we miss it. We'll trust somebody that they don't have any interest in getting right. And so we'll have to, you know, tell them again, until you change your attitude mentality, this is not the right place. But that's less often um, than it used to be, certainly. But I'm guessing that you've never once regretted trusting anyone because it was always worth a shot to see what they could potentially become. Am I correct? Well, yes, you're correct in the fact that um, it tells me more about me than it does about them if I'm willing to trust, right? So for me, the trust factor is as much about my attitude and mentality towards somebody as it is about whether or not they're going to receive that trust. Right, because as a society, we just we categorize people, right? So, you know, we try not to use the word homeless very much here because that identifies people. We use in transition, right? We don't use the word victim of sex trafficking. We use the word survivor, right? So we're always trying to change the vocabulary and the terminology to give people value. And I want to make sure that I stay um, on the edge of that myself rather than me looking at somebody's walking in going, well, he has six felonies. Well, he did this. Well, he did that. Right. So when I trust him first, then I'm pushing down even my own prejudices uh, at the beginning. And that, that's just something that's an ongoing process. Definitely. One thing I really wanted to ask you was your perspective on what people to deserve. So I'm college educated from New Jersey. Um, many people I know feel they're entitled to what they've been given or they're entitled to what they've earned. I went to, I went to college. I can't take a job for $40,000. I need to get this much money. And I wanted to ask you how spending so much time with people who have so little has changed your personal perspective on what people have earned or what they deserve in life. Yeah, I, you know, I th it, it, that's a little bit of a difficult question. My answer, though, is I think everybody deserves opportunity. And that's pretty much all I think anybody deserves, right? So it, it's not a matter of, well, you, you deserve to make more money or you deserve to live in this house or you deserve this. Everybody deserves opportunity. And then you choose to do whatever it is you do with your opportunity, right? And so, uh, you know, I, I had opportunity. I, I City Refuge is now, you know, as I mentioned, we're around the country. We're well thought of. We've got a lot of accolades. All I had in the beginning was an opportunity. We had a little rundown church with very few people and no money. And we felt like we had a call. So we went down. It was just an opportunity. And nobody funded our opportunity. Nobody made the road smoother. We had to figure all that out, right? And so for me, if you're born into poverty, you just deserve an opportunity to get out of poverty. If you're born or if you're raised in an abusive household, you need an opportunity to get out of that, right? So it doesn't matter if you come from the mountains of Virginia like me or from Jersey like you or from the inner city of Atlanta, 
I just think everybody deserves an opportunity and that as people who care about each other, if we can be a part of creating that pathway of opportunity, we should. Definitely. Definitely. That's yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, so every, a lot of people are, are grappling with who they want to be in life and they understand their, their faults and their, um, their strengths. And some people, and some people don't even really know, don't want to do this introspective look and to see who they really are. And you talk about this idea of trusting first. So I wanted to see what your advice was for someone who has let themselves down so many times and what advice do you have for someone who feels they can't even trust themselves, let alone someone in the external world? Yeah, I, you know, the first thing I would do is ask them to ask questions of themselves. Why do I continue this path? Why do I continue to make bad decisions? Why have I let myself down so often? There's always a back reason for these things, right? So. Sometimes that is from the outside and sometimes that's self-inflicted. But without knowing the cause, the root cause of why behavior is exhibited in the way that it is, prevents us from ever being able to adjust and, and make that behavior correct behavior, right? So if somebody comes to us that has an addiction issue, for example, well, let's talk about this. You know, what is there addiction in your family? Is this a, a you know, is this a thing that has been passed from generation to generation? Was there a place of darkness or grief in your life that caused you to uh, move over to painkillers, which led you to something else, which led you to something else? Is there an identity issue? Is there a self-worth issue? Do you not believe that you are worthy of, of being successful? So we try to go back to whatever that root cause was. And if we can get to the root cause, um, then we can have great success moving forward. Uh, the way we function particularly in Western civilization, is we want to address the outcomes or the behavior without addressing the root issue, right? So we want to say, don't be homeless, but we don't have a pathway for them to own their own home, right? We want to say, well, you shouldn't, you know, shoot heroin or, or meth, but we don't have a pathway to help them get a job that's a paying job that gives them enough wage where they don't have to revert to bad behavior, which then leads to depression, which then leads to addiction. Right. So finding out that root cause and, and then encouraging the individual to dig down and deal with the root cause is, is, is the best way that we have found in order to see change and success take place. Uh, and especially with those who don't believe in themselves, like you mentioned at the start of this question, you know, um, and, and my team knows we're going to believe in everybody, right? Everybody walks in that dignity piece. Our core values are passion, excellence, dignity, and integrity. And when they walk in, we're going to call their name. We're going to find out what they eat. We're going to find out what they like to eat, what their favorite color is. So their jacket can be that way. You know, we're going to, we're going to do these things to show them we believe in them. And that activates inside of them a belief process in themselves. I, I just love that so much. And I'm, I'm so young and I haven't had nearly as much experience as you in, in this realm at all. But um, something about me, I've just, I think it's just my, my parents, my dad's a very confident person. I've always had this innate belief in myself and it seems to attract me to people who don't feel the same way. And I always have conversations with them and I'm trying to explain like, like, yo, you're the man or you're like the coolest girl I've ever met. And it, the words can't um, describe it to them. So I would love to hear like an example or a story of when you've met someone who truly had, I, I don't want, all right, I'm not going to bring up very personal example, but who didn't think they were a good person. And after years of, of trying has had changed their mind and actually thinks that they like loves themselves, went from hating themselves to actually loving themselves and accepting themselves for who they are. Yeah. You know, Ryan comes to mind. Ryan grew up in, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, was beaten into a gang when he was 13 years old, had an abusive stepfather, traveled the country 14 years, running robbery crews, uh, in and out of prison, addiction, seven felonies. When he got to us, he was just like, I'm never going to make it. I know I'm either going to end up killed or suicide or in prison the rest of my life. And so the day after we met him, we literally moved him into a, it was a, an office, uh, just a small, probably 12 by 12 office on our campus in City Refuge said, here's your room. And uh, because he was living in a, in a gang house, a drug house, he said, here's your room, here's food. 
And then I started, I just got up two or three days later. I said, hey, go ride with me. He said, where are you going? I said, just get in the car. So I just took him around whatever I was doing that day, traveling to speak, go speak with me. Well, I don't know what to, just go and, you know, just go and act like you're my bodyguard, you know. So we just take him places, having him over to our family for dinner. You know, a um, little side sentimental story, you know, he was 30 years old. He was at our house on an Easter Sunday and having lunch and my, my girls were small, they colored their eggs and they left. And Ryan just kept sitting at the table coloring eggs for like an hour. And one of my girls came in and I said, dad, why is Ryan still coloring eggs? I said, because it's the first time in his life that he's ever colored Easter eggs. He's 30 years old, he had never colored Easter eggs, right? So just invite him into my house, invite him to get in the car and go ride with me. You know, his favorite thing for a long time, let's just go get a Chick-fil-A bre- uh, chicken bas- biscuit for breakfast. And he would just get in the car. We would just ride there and get the biscuit, ride back to campus. You know, and, and out of that, we developed a strong enough relationship that we eventually hired him. He became employed. We were able to get his record expunged, which was miraculous. And now he owns his own security company, has three dozen employees um, here in in Atlanta, provide security on our campus where he was rescued 14, 15 years ago, right? So again, it's just that trust. First, get in the car and let's go for a ride. Well, this man has shot and killed people in his past. He's been in and out of jail for assault, for robbery, for everything you can think of. And one day off the street, we're like, let's ride around. And just so everybody knows, I've been challenged pretty hard on this mentality by which I live. There are people who say, well, you're putting your family at risk. You're putting yourself at risk. And my response is, you're right. You know, but 25 years later, while we've had some pretty close calls, we're all still here. And we've seen 25,000 lives transformed in those 25 years. So is the, is the risk worth the return? And for me, it is. The risk of... And, putting myself in dangerous environments or environments with people that could take advantage of us or, or be harmful to us is worth it because of the reward and the return that comes somewhere down the road a vast majority of the time. Well, the, the return is also a meaningful life. And I, I didn't want to bring this up, but I can't help but, but mention it. If you were to die doing what you're doing, don't you, don't you, in your last moment, wouldn't you still feel that you had done the right thing all along and that your, your purpose had been served and you know that your team will continue the mission on without you? Yeah, without question. I mean, without question. I've been asked that question a few times that, you know, how would you feel if you knew you were leaving your wife and your kids and your grandkids? I'm like, I've set an example for them as to how life should be lived. You know, and, and having been here as long as I am now, folks in the city know us, they respect us. I don't have nearly as many challenges from people that are living criminal lifestyles as I used to. Um, so I told my, my exec team recently, I said, you know, I haven't been in a good fight in a couple of years. In order to keep my credibility, I probably need to go out in the hood and find it. You know, so it's like, <laughs> it's just one of those things where you want to stay right on that edge of, of uh, you know, the adrenaline rush needs to stay in my life. Uh, you know, again, I don't need to put myself at risk, but I need to constantly be inserting myself in environments and atmospheres that desperately need what we bring, even if it is challenging for us. Um, that just keeps me on the edge and making me makes me want to work harder to do what we do. I I just can't explain my admiration for you in words. It's just it's so great to have you here. Um, so you've spent your whole life or your majority of your life, just continually giving yourself to others, always, always trying to be this float or this source of love to people who haven't had it. But as you know, in mainstream society, most people either believe or act in the sense that um, you must consider yourself before you can consider helping others. I use the example like on the airplane where they say like, you got to put your own mask on before assisting the child. I'm just wondering how you, you deal with that, uh, that sentiment swirling around in society when you're a living example that it's just not exactly the case. Yeah, that's a really good observation. And people who do this kind of work often neglect self-care. Um, and, and so you know, again, because I'm a man of faith, that's where I get a lot of my strength. And so my morning quiet time meditation gives me opportunity for that. Incredible wife, uh, obviously, they've been with me for this 25 years. So I just carve out time for my wife and my kids. I've always said I'm never going to let the work we do rob relationship with my family. I don't want them to ever resent what I do. 
Uh, the other things I just try to take care of me, right? So I work out on a regular basis. We got a you know workout center here, so I work out with my sons-in-law, with my staff. I still, you know, I'm 61. I still play uh, competitive basketball, play in softball leagues, I play golf. I run. Uh, so you know, I do. I just those are the things. Competitive things energize me and keep me feeling more youthful than my than my biological age is. So uh, just trying to really stay active in life and and maintaining my family relationship and then my faith relationship. Those are sort of the three pillars for me that keep me sharp. Um, and then, you know, if there are days where there's a little bit of a struggle for me or for staff, we just start recounting stories of success. So we don't spend much time talking about failure. If there's something we could have done better, we want to know that. But we just recount to each other over and over stories of success. And those just energize and motivate us to keep going. Excellent. Bruce, it's been so so great to talk to you today. I just wanted to kind of go back to the beginning as we come to the end here. And I would love to hear your your experience of being called to do this work and, and your advice for young people who don't have an explicit call to do something and are kind of lost in their direction. What would you say to someone like that? Well, you know, I think we all are created with um, specific skill sets, talents, abilities, passions. And, and you know, unfortunately, um, people sometimes settle for what's convenient. So they settle for the employment opportunity that's convenient and, and maybe compensates them well. They settle for a role in life that is OK. Um, but, you know, I would just challenge your listeners you know, what is it that drives you? What makes your heart beat faster? What takes your breath away? What what causes you to begin to think creatively and outside the box of normal lifestyle, right? Um, and and if, if there are things in your life that cause that adrenaline rush or that heartbeat increase or that breath catching, then that's probably something you should investigate. And, and see, is this a place where I can be? Because those are the places that generally bring the greatest sense of fulfillment, right? Um, you know, you know, we we are we we only got we only get one shot at it, right? So you know, we we all come to the place where the last breath leaves, and I don't want to be at that last breath and go. You know, the, there's a famous quote they say that Wyatt Earp that his last breath he just looked at those around and just said two words: "What if." Right. I don't want to get to the end of my life and go, what if? What if I'd done more? What if I'd given more? What if, you know, Schindler's List, the, the last scene in the movie, Schindler is, has a little pinky ring on. And he goes, what if I had sold this ring? I could have saved one more, maybe 10 more. What if I'd done this? And I just I would challenge you and your listeners and those to just to live a, a lifestyle with a mentality. that says when I get to the end, I'm not going to have to say what if. When I get to the end, I'm gonna look back and go, "That gum, that was fun." I could, I couldn't agree more, man. Uh, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Um, any final piece, uh, pieces of advice for people who are passionate about um, creating a better world around us, fixing society, having a positive impact on those around you? Yeah, just go for it. Do something. You know, we can't do, uh, we can't do everything that needs to be done. I'm not here to change the world. I'm just here to, to impact my corner of the world. So if your thing is climate control or if it's homeless or if it's survivors of trafficking or if it's economic e equality, figure out what your thing is and do something in that space and just see what it might become somewhere down the road. Follow your passion. Bruce, it's been an absolute honor. No, it's been my honor. Thank you. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrboulder.com today.